Um, okay, then I'll go ahead and start. So my name is Nikita Popov, and today I'm going to talk a bit about my favorite LVM topic, which is opaque pointers. Um, so I'll start with just a few words about myself. Uh, I work at Red Hat on the Platform Tools team, which maintains various toolchain technologies like GCC, glibc, Binutils, and also has a couple of people working on the um, LVM Clang Rust ecosystem, which is where I work. And um, like in the last few three or four months, um, like maybe half my work has been on the on finishing the opaque pointer migration, which is why I'm talking about it now. And um, also kind of relevant is that I maintain the LVM compile time tracker. So I try to make sure that um, compile times in LVM don't regress, or at least don't regress without a good reason. And we will see that compile time um, also kind of factors into the opaque pointer work. And I think with that out of the way, um, I can jump right into the topic and explain what opaque pointers are about. The core idea is that instead of having different pointer types, like a pointer to i8, pointer to i32, pointer to array, pointer to function, pointer to struct, uh, we only have one single opaque pointer type, uh, which we spell simply as PTR, which does not specify what it um, supposedly points to. This is not strictly true because we still have the concept of address spaces. Um, because we do need to distinguish address spaces. Address spaces can have different representation, um, like different pointer sizes, different index sizes, and generally different semantics. But what opaque pointers do is to say that there is only a single pointer type for each address space. And this is a very, I would say, major um, change to the LVM IR design. Uh, which has taken a lot of effort to implement. So there should be some good motivation for why we are doing it. And the core motivation um, can be summarized like this. Pointer element types in LVM simply do not carry any semantics, or at least they are not supposed to carry any semantics. Here we have a function accepting a pointer to i32. And what does that actually mean? It doesn't mean that the pointer is four byte aligned, because for that, we have a separate <laughs> aligned notation. It does mean that the pointer is four byte referenceable, because once again, we have a separate annotation for that. It doesn't imply that. Uh, there are any particular aliasing semantics in place. For example, uh, like that this is an integer for a strict aliasing purposes in C. Once again, we have um, type-based alias analysis metadata to specify that. And most generally, it does not imply that we are going to access this yeah, pointer I using an I32 type. I mean, in now I take all physical in uh, Argentina. Yeah, I'm really happy so much because about the surprise and also this super hard list today. I think there is some noise going in the background, but I'll yeah, trying to figure out from whom. Continue. Um, so the reason why we don't get any guarantees is essentially that um, pointers can be arbitrarily bit casted. So here is a more complex example. We accept a pointer to double. Um, as an argument, then we bitcast it into a pointer to pointer, store a null pointer, and then we load uh, from a pointer to integer. And in this code, there are a lot of types, but only three types that uh, have semantic relevance. One is the bival type, because um, bival means we perform an implicit stack copy, and to do a stack copy, we need to know how large, how many bytes we're supposed to copy. Then uh, the type of the stored value is relevant, so we need to know how many bytes we're storing. And once again, the type of loaded value is relevant because we need to know how many bytes we're loading. And opaque pointers 
retain these semantically relevant types and remove um, all the other types because those can always be converted to the like uh, required type through by inserting a bitcast instruction. And yeah, that's basically the motivation. But of course, um, from that, we can derive uh, quite a few practical impacts. And the first one is that if we have opaque pointers, we no longer need pointer bitcasts. And if we don't need them, we don't need to store them in memory. And optimizations don't have to skip past those bitcasts, which means we improve memory usage and compile time in LVM. I have a couple of uh, preliminary numbers for that. So these are compile time numbers for CTMark. So this is using Clang um, on the LVM test suit. And the result here is, yeah, some reasonable improvements like the geo mean is 2.6%. And on some benchmarks, we have something like uh, four or five, even 8% improvements. Uh, though I should say there is this little disclaimer written on the right um, that opaque pointers like maybe ideally shouldn't but in practice do impact optimization behavior and uh, later in the presentation I think it should be clear why so this is not like a strictly um, apples to apples comparison where we get a compile time improvement while generating perfectly the same code uh, there may be discrepancies but I think like the general idea of these numbers um, is in the right ballpark These are some numbers for the Rust compiler. Um, I think, yeah, in general idea is the same. We also have some like four, five, six percent improvements, uh, depending on what kind of program you're compiling. And these are numbers for memory usage on the Rust side. And once again, get varying improvements uh, with one kind of outlier of 10%. But I guess you you get the picture. So. I know that not all people in the LVM community care as much about compile time as I personally do. Uh, most people are a lot more interested in the runtime performance aspect and OPEC pointers help us in that area as well um, for a couple of reasons. The first and probably most obvious one is that while optimizations are supposed to ignore bitcasts um, because they are no ops. And many optimizations do ignore them, um, especially if they are driven by a cost model. So if you query um, TTI and about the bitcast, it will tell you, okay, the bitcast is free and you should ignore it. But in practice, we have many optimizations that are not driven by a cost model. So especially if we are doing something like a limited upwards instruction walk to find the memory clubber, uh, then those optimizations will generally not go out of their way to skip over bitcasts. And that means that they do end up impacting optimization and optimization heuristics. With opaque pointers, those bitcasts don't exist so we eliminate this problem by design. So a bitcast that doesn't exist can't affect optimization. I think the more important aspect um, is a different one, which is that if you have a pointer value or you have two pointer values, uh, which, which point to the same address, but have a different pointer type, then generally we want LVM to consider those as equivalent because the pointer type, as said previously, doesn't carry any semantic information. And in this example, um, we are yeah, doing something pretty simple. We are storing a null pointer as a pointer to I8, and then we are reloading it from the same address as a pointer to I32. And in this situation, we should be able to perform store to load forwarding and replace the load uh, with a null pointer constant. And the full GVN pass with its like fully sophisticated type punning logic is capable of performing that optimization, but less sophisticated optimizations like early CSE um, can't do that because we have this bitcast sitting in between and the values are no longer like obviously equivalent. 
With opaque pointers, uh, that problem again goes away by design because now we no longer distinguish a pointer type. We are just storing the null pointer and then reloading from the same location. So even um, early CSE can optimize that without any additional logic. And that, of course, affects all other optimizations that in some way reason about uh, value equivalence, which is quite a few optimizations, at least in minor ways. OK. And then the third performance-related aspect I want to highlight. So I wouldn't really call this one a direct benefit of opaque pointers, because you can do the same thing um, using type pointers. It's more that opaque pointers force us to uh, implement optimizations in a certain way that is beneficial to um, optimization power. And to illustrate that, I'm using an example from argument promotion. Uh, so we have the add function here at the top, which loads to struct elements, adds them together, and returns the result. What argument promotion does is to move those loads outside the add function into the caller, and then pass in scalar values into the um, add function. This is a bit silly in this example because uh, the optimization just moves loads from one function to another one, so we don't really win anything here. Uh, the actual idea is that in the caller, uh, those loads might be based on an alloc A, and then Memtorec or SROA can um, eliminate those, and then everything would be working on scalars. But like for the purpose of illustration, let's keep with a simple example. Uh, what I actually want to show is how, the, how this optimization and how many other optimizations in LVM uh, used to be implemented, which is by looking at get element pointer indexes. So we would say that, okay, uh, we have one load at index 00, 0 and another load at index 0, 01. And then we can, for example, replace index 00, 0 with one argument and index 0, 01 with the other argument. The big problem with that kind of approach is that get element pointers, uh, get element pointer indexes are not unique. Uh, the most obvious way in which they are not unique is that you can always add or remove uh, zero indexes from the end. But if there are any array types involved, there is actually a like essentially infinite number of ways you can encode the exact same address. Um, so here, the first one. So all three of these um, point to the second struct element. The first one does so directly. The second one does so by pointing uh, to the end of the array, which happens to be at the same address as the start of the struct. And the last one does so by first going to the end of the struct and then going backwards one element inside the array. And all of those are perfectly legal in LVM. Um, so we call that notional over-indexing, and it's legal even for inbounds get element pointer instructions. The end result is that to work on get element pointer indexes, uh, you have to be careful uh, to restrict them. And it's essentially impossible to support bitcasts in that case, because if you allow bitcasts, then the source element type, uh, so the struct type here of the get element pointer can also change and you can't really ensure uniqueness just by looking at indexes in that case. And if you don't support bitcasts, you also can't support opaque pointers um, because opaque pointers make bitcasts implicit. What optimizations should be do, doing instead and uh, what we did for various optimizations when migrating to opaque pointers is to look at offsets. So, in this example, we see that, okay, first we have one load of an i32 at offset zero, and then another one at offset four. So what we're doing is we are deriving the effective struct type from the actual access pattern inside the function, instead of relying on um, type information that has been encoded in the IR. Which means that uh, even if the type information that has been encoded is incorrect, uh, for example, because the function accepts like on the C level a void pointer, so an I8 pointer, and then gets bit cast to something else, that would still be supported. Um, 
so yeah, as said before, this is not strictly speaking a benefit of opaque pointers. It's more that um, the opaque pointers migration has forced us to actually rewrite uh, optimization passes to work in this way. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about performance. Um, in addition to that, there is also some uh, implementation complexity to consider. This point only applies in a world where we actually only support opaque pointers and not have our current um, transitionary state where we support both type pointers and opaque pointers, in which case uh, complexity can only grow. But once we only have opaque pointers, um, that means we no longer have to insert any bit casts. Um, and there are also some second order effects. To give one example is that currently the type system in LVM is recursive or it can contain cycles. So here we have a struct type that contains a pointer to itself. And this kind of struct type cannot be constructed atomically. So the way to construct it is to first create a dummy type and then uh, populate the body with a, with a pointer back to itself. So the type system has to be mutable. With opaque pointers, that goes away. So in that case, this, is, this simply becomes a struct uh, with, an, with an opaque pointer um, member. And that can be constructed atomically and all the types in the type system can become immutable. So yeah, there are also a couple of other follow-up IR changes we can make once um, opaque pointers have, once we only support opaque pointers. But uh, that part I'm going to talk a bit at the very end of the presentation. Because uh, first, I think, at least I hope that at this point I have like provided sufficient motivation for why we are doing the migration to opaque pointers and want to talk about the more technical aspects of how it actually is being done. Um, there are multiple parts to that. The first one is some IR changes to explicitly um, write down types that are semantically relevant. So historically, um, the load instruction did not specify the type being loaded because it could be derived from the pointer element type. Um, nowadays, and actually these IR changes have already happened many, many years in the past. So if you've been working with LVM recently, this is just the way things have been. But anyway, um, now we explicitly specify the type being loaded. And with type pointers, this is simply a redundant information because uh, the loaded type and the pointer element type are required to match. With opaque pointers, this information is no longer redundant. And we have to explicitly provide it. So same thing has happened in other places like get element pointer uh, instructions by val, by ref, sred, and so on attributes. Of course, when we get to actual code, the primary change is that all the uses of the get pointer element type method have to be removed. And the way we do it is by instead inspecting some kind of semantically relevant type um, depending on the context. So this could be for loads, the load return type instead of the load pointer element type. For stores, it would be the um, stored value type. For globals, it would be the global value type. For calls, it would be the call function type, uh, and so on. And um, in particular, we also have some migration helpers to cover some particularly common situations. Uh, which is consistency assertions in this example. So um, as said, a load for a load, the load return type currently has to match the 
pointer element type of the load pointer operand if you're using type pointers. And if you're using opaque pointers, then there is no requirement because there is no pointer element type to compare to. So this is what this um, is opaque or pointy type equals method does. And of course, uh, once we have a world with only opaque pointers, these migration helpers will go away and these assertions are essentially dropped entirely. One important aspect to mention here is that code like this, so code that constructs a pointer to a specific element type still continues working in opaque pointer mode. Uh, the element type is simply ignored in that case. The result of that is that code that has been written to work with type pointers um, essentially just works uh, in opaque pointer mode as long as you don't go out of your way to access the pointer element type. This is like the general rule, but uh, there are some significant exceptions to that, uh, where code makes assumptions that no longer hold when opaque pointers are enabled. The main one uh, is illustrated here, which is that code currently, and for type pointers, this is a correct assumption, code currently assumes that um, if you have two accesses on the same exact same pointer value, then those accesses will use the same type, which is true for type pointers, but not true for opaque pointers. So in this example, we have a store to uh, a store of an i32 value and then a load of an i64 value. And we have to make sure that store to load forwarding is not performed in this case. And we do that by adding an explicit check that the load type and the store type are the same. So this is like one of the primary ways in which code written for type pointers will break with opaque pointers in a non-obvious way uh, that you will hit when doing actual testing. And uh, that is like not obvious to see just from looking at the code. Um, so that is the aspect in, in LLVM itself. Um, of course, we also have front ends, so which is the Clang front end, but also other out of tree front ends. And those also have to switch to track pointer element types on their own site instead of relying um, on the type stored in, in LVM's pointer type. Um, this is actually, I have to admit, kind of annoying. So it was pretty convenient uh, to have the element type tracked on the LVM site um, because now you, you have to track a separate structure in parallel but it's still a necessary change. And for Clang in particular, this was done by storing the pointer element type and the address and the L value and the R value structures. Finally, um, I spent a lot of time talking about opaque pointers, so I should mention how you can actually enable them. Um, you actually don't have to actively enable them uh, in, in most cases. So if you have IR that uses the opaque pointer type or bitcode that uses the opaque pointer type, we will automatically go into opaque pointer mode. And the opaque pointer mode is um, decided on the level of the LLVM context. So you can have uh, multiple LLVM contexts with some using opaque pointers, some using type pointers, um, but you can't mix opaque pointers and type pointers uh, in the same context. In addition to that, there is a flag to explicitly enable opaque pointers. And what this flag does, or what it is primarily useful for, is to take existing type pointer IR and convert it automatically to opaque pointers. So this is very handy to uh, run existing tests in opaque pointer mode. And this also works with old bitcode. Uh, so old type pointer bitcode can also be upgraded to opaque pointers, which is actually which has been uh, one of the larger engineering challenges of the migration, but it also works uh, well now. Um, okay. Yeah, this is kind of, Weird. So the opaque pointer migration has been 
proposed by David Blakey back in 2015. For reference, now is 2022, uh, so that's seven years ago. And why why did it get why did it take so long to um, actually realize this migration? Answer is pretty simple. I think um, it's just the massive scope. So we used to have many hundreds, um, possibly many thousands of uses uh, of pointer element type uses in the LLVM code base. Uh, most of them not direct, but indirect through uh, things like IR builder APIs. And some of those uses are really easy to remove. You just uh, take one call and replace it with another. And some of them require changes to the IR design or from scratch you write off transformation passes. So you say you need anywhere between like one minute and multiple work days to remove a single pointer element type access. And this work has happened kind of sporadically over the years. So usually with someone uh, stepping in, doing some work on the migration, and then there is again silence for, for multiple months. I think uh, the work only really picked up in last year when Arthur Eubanks introduced the actual OPEC pointer type, uh, which allowed us to write tests using OPEC pointers rather than just, um, you know, working on the concept in abstract. And since that has happened, we've been working to systematically remove all pointer element type accesses uh, in LVM and make sure that optimizations work, don't crash and don't miscompile uh, with OPEC pointers enabled. And now at the end of March, actually, uh, I guess it's the start of April, uh, we don't have any pointer element type accesses in LVM and Clang. So basically we are ready to enable OPEC pointers by default. And only problem is that act this is not just a matter of flipping the switch because we have a huge amount of tests that will be impacted by the change. So we have at least 7,000 tests in um, LVM and Clang that, well, I mean, if OPEC pointers are enabled, nothing fundamentally changes for those tests, but the like final rendering of the IR, if it contains any pointers is going to change. So we don't really have a, a complete consensus on how we are how we're going to tackle that. But in any case, it's expected that the default is going to change soon. And at least uh, the current plan is that we will not be maintaining both type pointer and OPEC pointer support at the same time in the long term. So the plan is to switch to OPEC pointers, then um, keep type pointer support on a best effort basis. So people um, can have a little bit more time to finish their the migrations for their out of tree code. And then after LVM 15 is branched to drop support for type pointers. Oh, okay. I thought it was done, but there is one more topic I wanted to uh, briefly briefly mention, which is not directly related to OPEC pointers. It's about uh, future work that would be based on top of them, uh, which is to remove one more um, place where we are currently using type information that is not entirely necessary, which is get element pointer instructions. So I've shown this example before, uh, which is three different get element pointer instructions all encoding the same address. And these are still using the same source element type. If we also change the source element type, we, could, we actually have even more different ways to encode the same offset. So extra examples are uh, using a I, I32 um, source element type, and then another one using an I8 type and instead uh, multiplying the index by four. All of those are equivalent. And for offset-based algorithms, which will convert the get element point instructions into offsets, um, those algorithms will realize that these are equivalent and we don't have a problem. But um, as usual, 
if things are equivalent, but we don't encode them, but we encode them in different ways, then we will always have um, optimizations that don't realize that equivalence. A particularly, I would say, quite embarrassing case um, is this one. So we have two get element pointer instructions that are obviously point to the same address, but currently nothing in the O3 optimization pipeline realizes that these are actually the same and that we can replace one of them with the other. If instead we drop the type from get element pointer and said that this instruction actually just takes a base pointer and an offset, then those instructions will be trivially equivalent. And once again, we would kind of solve this equivalence problem by design instead of solving it um, by doing extra work uh, at every place that somehow processes these instructions. So this is like just a basic idea at this point. Uh, so this is something I think we should do, but it's maybe not entirely clear um, how the technical details would look like. Uh, in particular, currently the get element pointer instruction effectively allows you to do um, like scaled multiply uh, operations where you have, for example, uh, multiply an index by four if you are indexing into an i32 array. And either we could retain support for that and allow get element pointer instructions to encode that, or we could say that get element pointer only accepts base pointer and offset and nothing else, in which case the offset calculation would have to be implemented in plain IR. Um, both of those have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantage of the second form is that it's more canonical. So uh, we will be, um, so there are less way, less different ways to encode the same thing, which is again, good for redundancy elimination purposes. While the former variant would be easier to cost model um, because get element pointer cost modeling is pretty tricky because it ties in with I mean, we usually assume that get element pointer is going to be used in the loader store and load stores have um, like target specific addressing modes. And some of those uh, may be able to fold part of the offset calculation directly into the uh, loader store instruction and render it effectively free. And this is harder to model uh, if the, this, this offset calculation is not part of the instruction itself. Um, but yeah, this is just some ideas for, for a follow-up change. And I think there are more places that um, could be changed in that direction. For example, things like bival types, um, those don't really need to know the actual type. They only need to know the size and the alignment of the type. So generally, I think that um, LVM currently uses type and specifies types in more places that are strictly necessary and that leads to uh, limits the optimization power. Okay, um, now this is actually all I wanted to say. Uh, we have some nice documentation for opaque pointers at that URL, which in particular uh, um, also has some more detailed instructions for migrating code to support opaque pointers. Um, but yeah, so thanks for listening. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Yeah, first of all, thanks for um, giving this talk. I think this uh, opaque pointers are pretty um, like infrastructure wide, wide chain. So it is good to learn about this. Um, let me see if there is a question. I guess someone raised the hand a little bit earlier. And if you want to speak, then uh, I can, un you can unmute yourself. Let me see. Um, not sure if there is anyone who has raised their hand yet. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, give me give me a timeline. Give me a date. When are we switching over? What do you think? Um, 
so I already put up a discourse thread last week uh, for enabling them by default in Clang. So basically as soon as that Discord thread gets a consensus. So we are looking at like maybe next week, maybe two weeks, but I would say very soon. I have a question. Um, some of the um, like middle end optimizations who would uh, like, like they basically um, rely on like let's say alias analysis or like for specifically load, and um, because of the opaque pointer, they have to make certain changes now, right? Like one of the optimization I wrote, GVN hoist, um, because of the opaque pointer, and um, we saw a bug like there was a miscompilation. And uh, it was fixed because it was not, um, it was like the change was very localized. Do you have any guidance or something for like other optimization writers they need to keep in mind? So I believe the GVN hoist issue is essentially this one, yeah. uh, where there is an assumption that um, like all the loads on the same point wrap run also have the same load type. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I found that these issues are not really something you can find by doing a grep over the code base. Um, so this is just something that turns up as an assertion failure when you test and uh, when it turns up, it's usually easy to fix by adding that additional type check or in the case of GVN hoist by adding the type into the um, like value. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's what we did, ended up doing. We have to hash the type as well as the pointer like both things thank you exactly so we did that change in other places as well like um the gvn pass but because gvn hoist uh is not enabled by default yeah. like we didn't run into that ourselves and other people who do use the pass found that issue yeah okay so maybe, maybe one more question um over the years i've found especially in academia, a lot of times that people relied on these types. So they interpreted them as if they had meaning. So they said, oh yeah, yeah, because you know, this is an I-32 pointer, I know things about it. Which as you said in the beginning is not like true in the sense of the LLVMIR standard or definition. But what, what do those people now do? I mean, are they stuck on their version that has, that has types or is there a way out for them? Um, I think in most cases, uh, the answer is the, the bit about offset-based um, optimizations I talked about. So instead of uh, looking at the pointer element type, you, you look at the uses of the pointer and you look at uh, what kind of load stores it's used in. And from that, you can derive the necessary type information. I think that for nearly all cases, that is the approach you should be using. Maybe sometimes you actually need additional information um, that's simply not available in LLVM IR and has to be encoded um, by the front end. So like um, type-based alias analysis would be an example of that. Uh, so it might be that in some cases the information is not available and you have to explicitly add it. But I think this kind of looking at uh, how accesses look like is the, the main main way to handle it. Great, thanks. I think we have more hands up. Go ahead. Um, I guess Deming raised first, so please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, I want to know uh, why there is a GP in the first place. I, I wonder, <laughs> I know that's, <laughs> it seems to me um, GP is not necessary. Uh, um, yeah, so you are in the, of... uh, in the last two slide, uh, last second slide. Um, could it turn it to, um, yeah, uh, uh, next one, the ne next slide. Oh, yes. I, yeah, this, 
I wonder, I wonder why. <laughs> GP, we have GP、um, in the first place.、Um, okay, so I mean, what would the alternative be?、Um, in the end, we have to have some kind of、um, way to do offset arithmetic with pointers. And the reason why we can't simply use an add is that pointers carry provenance. So we want to distinguish、um, offset arithmetic on pointers because、um, you know, adding an offset to a pointer should preserve the provenance of the base pointer. And、um, well, like if we if we moved away from this、um, type-based structural. Um, representation, which has historically existed, and I guess is kind of、um, handy for front ends because then the the whole offset calculation part、um, is offloaded to LVM instead of making the front end like compute at which offset a certain struct member, for example, would be laid out after considering alignment and so on. But if we have an offset-based implementation, then get element pointer effectively just becomes、um, like kind of a, a provenance-preserving addition instruction. That would be my answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Ivan,、uh, you want to. Unmuted. Even we cannot hear you if you are speaking. No, we cannot hear.、You. Maybe if you want to type, that is also fine. Let's let、uh, Brian.、Um, Brian, if you want to ask question. Yes, thank you.、Um, um, thanks, Nikita, for the talk.、Um, I、uh, so I might have missed it in your talk, but、uh, when we use a gap to create a, a pointer, like a,、uh, an opaque pointer,、um, is this the type of IR that we 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 see, or is that is that the way it's currently implemented? Because we used to,、uh, you know, walk through a bunch of indexes and find, for example, like、uh, array elements and field indexes and so on. And then, like, what would the、uh, arithmetic look like in the new world? And how much work would it be to change,、uh, you know, from the old style to the new? Um, so I should just emphasize again the the bit I mentioned here at the end that's not part of the opaque pointer work. So that's、uh, future work that、uh, doesn't currently impact wouldn't currently impact you.、Um, but the way I would expect this to work is that、um, LVM still essentially provides the existing APIs for creating get element pointer instructions. Uh, so the ones that are based around types, but then,、um, for example, the IR builder would simply internally、um, convert that into the appropriate offsets. So I think, like in terms of user-facing change, it shouldn't make much of a difference.、Um, I hope. Hmm. Does that answer the question or not?、Uh, so, so are you saying that currently, when we create a gap instruction, it cannot return a、uh, opaque pointer, or can it accept an opaque pointer for that matter?、Um, no. So, it、oh. can. I mean, in, if you are in opaque pointer mode, then all pointers are always opaque, which means that get element pointer instructions both accept and return.、Um, Opaque pointers, which is why, well, let me go to a different slide.、Mm -hmm. I know this is which is why we have、um, this explicit source element type that is specified in get element pointer instructions, and that is the type that is actually used to、uh, perform the the offset arithmetic. But in the end, both the input and the output are opaque pointers. 
Right, but this example doesn't show me how uh, I could, for example, walk a uh, structure with substructures and so on. Like, would you need to have multiple types in the in the statement then? Like the type of the substructure and the type of the field in the substructure and so on? And so I'm not really sure I understand the question. So if I go back to this one, uh, you can see the first one has like this more complex type uh, right. where you can like index into a substructure and that kind of get element point instruction still works fine with um, opaque pointers. They don't really make a difference there. I, ah, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It's I just uh, like the requirement goes away that the input and the output um, pointers have a specific type, but you can still uh, specify um, as the source element type um, whatever you specified previously. All right, thank you. So uh, Ivan uh, typed his question. I'll, I'll read for him. He says that, is there a guidance what C, C++ programmers should avoid in their C++ or C programs to help OPEC pointer migration? Um, answer to that one is simple. It's just no. Um, this is a purely an internal uh, implementation detail of LVM and it does not affect in any way the kind of C or C++ code uh, that will be that's accepted or something like that. Sounds good. Any more questions? David. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you presented to us uh, a nice compile time data. And I would like to know about uh, some some benchmarks. Uh, did you also check some per performance, whether it was improved or, um, or personally, did you observe some regressions? Personally, I Thanks. didn't, but I know that um, Arthur Eubanks ran some benchmarks with like Google's internal workloads, and he basically reported back that there are, well, some wins and losses. Um, there are, so the regressions were uh, mainly around uh, cost modeling differences, where uh, different get element pointer structure resulted in different cost modeling for unrolling. So some loops that were previously unrolled are not unrolled and some that were previously not unrolled are unrolled because, um, yeah, the structure of the get element pointers is not quite, doesn't always end up being the same when opaque pointers are used. But the general impression I got is that it's, yeah, more or less uh, performance neutral uh, depending on the case. Thank you. So um, it's not a question, just uh, uh, I want to know, this was like a very massive change, right? And then um, if it works well in a couple of weeks, it will be like mostly over apart for some from some maintenance. Do you have any next thing that you're up to? Like something big like this you plan to work on? Um, well, apart from the get element pointer change, um, possibly something to look at would be um, constant expressions, which is something we wanted to largely remove for a long time because um, they cause various complications, mainly because people just don't really consider that we can have complex constants uh, when they write optimizations, which then, for example, causes infinite loops in, in combined. Um, but once again, that would be a very large and invasive change. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to work on that. <laughs> but it would be definitely beneficial to, to work on that. Uh, okay, thanks for the talk. It was pretty informative. I, I hope um, everyone liked it.